almost about that time. Right about now. Right about now. Funk, funk, funk. Funk, so brother, brother, brother. So David McRaney, welcome to the Right About Now podcast. Hey, thank you so much for having me. Thank you so much for inviting me. This is this is fantastic. I uh, I just before for everyone listening, we just adored each other's microphones, and I think that's yes. the best mark of p- people who are in podcasting. So <laughs> it's really great to be here. Yes, we are we are we are geeking out over our equipment, and I love to hear your voice in such. I was just I mentioned before I we rolled tape that you that I've been listening to your voice in my car because you did your own book reading um, for Audible, and uh, so now I feel like I know you. But oh, that's good. And do you think when you read your own book, uh, you know, out loud like that, do you are there moments when you're like, hmm, I probably should have written this a different way? Because it's a different experience, right? When you're reading it out loud as opposed to writing it. I think what happens mostly is I remember, I just remember everything that led to that sentence. Like yeah. I it it's a it's a truly psychedelic experience of remembering all the years. Or maybe for one particular section, I'll remember that all the days that I spent with that person, or I'll remember um, the all the emails that led to the books, that led to the literature, that led to the next emails, that led to the interview, that led to the oh, I didn't understand this, and I spent way too much time in the shower thinking about this, and then yeah. I wrote on the wall, and then and then you you it's when you're reading it out loud, you're like, this is one sentence. This one sentence was a big part of my life. And the person listening will never know that. And I can't, I can't stop right now and go, Hey everybody, before I say this next thing, I just want you to know this was crazy. Like, like, the, so you have no so, idea what it took me to write this sentence. Yeah. So I, it was great. And as I had never done that, read the entire book from beginning to end um, out loud. And it was just, there's something it, it, it made me feel a lot of emotions. I didn't expect. There was this one part, part uh, one portion where we were reading, um, there's a part where I was at Westboro Baptist church and, um, I had to stop at, at, cause it was, it was getting on top of me emotionally. And I asked for a break and everybody was really cool about it because it was just really tough to speak from their perspective. And then there are other portions of the book where I'm talking about my own personal life that just, I was like, Oh, I didn't expect this was going to make me tear up Emotion. in the audio booth. Wow. So, um, it was an incredible experience to read out loud. My other, my first two books were read by Don Hagen, who did those great uh, real men of genius commercials for Budweiser back in the mm-hmm. day. <laughs> and and uh, but since I've had a podcast for so long, they were like, yeah, you should do the audiobook this time. And I really appreciate it. It was one of the best parts of it. Well, let's talk a little bit about your own journey here. Um, for those who are not familiar with your work, uh, they should be. But tell us a little backstory, a little origin story. You were not a person... Uh, who thought minds could be changed. In fact, you wrote about <laughs> the opposite, <laughs> that people yeah. couldn't change their minds. So this is, tell us a little bit about that journey for you. Sure. This is, um, I had through all sorts of, a very circuitous, circuitous uh, route or route, as they say in my part of the world, got to um, um, being a podcaster and person who writes about these topics, mainly about motivated reasoning. Um, is sort of a, a pairing of motivated reasoning and uh, the introspection illusion. Um, it, this, the way I like to say it without having to use those terms is you're unaware of how unaware you are, and you're also the unreliable narrator of the story of your life. That's sort of the, the two principles of you are not so smart. And a lot of that has to do with motivated cognition and motivated reasoning, which is we've all experienced that. There's two ways everybody has experienced it. One is you wanted a piece of chocolate cake and uh but you thought maybe I ought not get it. And so you kind of had to come up with a reason that you should get it. Uh, that's motivated reasoning right there. Mm-hmm. <laughs> like, like, <laughs> Hey, I didn't eat anything yesterday or yeah. I, uh, I'm good I'll be, that. I'll do something. I'll, I'm going to lift weights later. It'll be fine. That kind of thing. It's motivated. You can find a way. There's a reason why you need, or especially like I deserve it. There's all sorts of things. Mm-hmm. <clears throat> My favorite example of motivated reasoning is for uh, when a person is uh, falling in love or entering into a new relationship, uh, all the little quirks that a person has, like the, the way they talk, the things they, uh, the way they they cut up their food, uh, their favorite movies, blah blah blah. These are the re- these are reasons why you like them. And then right. when you're, if you if you're breaking up with that person, those become the reasons why you're breaking up with that person. The <laughs> they remain the same reasons. They remain the same things, but um, your motivations have changed. Like and it. when your motivations, whatever your motivation is, you go cherry picking all the evidence available to you for justifications, rationalizations, and explanations for the way you are feeling. And that's motivated reasoning as well. So that used to be what I wrote about all the time and talked about all the time. And I find it very compelling. 
and very liberating to understand yourself in that way. Hence, you are not so smart and everything that I make in that place. Right, you but, are not so smart is your, is your last book. Yeah. And I had gotten to the point where I was doing lectures about it and all sorts of stuff. And in one of the lectures, someone came up to me and asked, they had a family member who had fallen into a, one of the deeper conspiracy theories. And they asked, what can I do about that? And I remember saying nothing. Uh, okay. And I was so descriptive at the time and I wasn't very prescriptive. And I was so, I'd, I was seeing, I was thinking of all the ways we're irrational and illogical. I can remember when I said that to the person that it felt like I was locking my keys in my car back when that was the thing you could do. Like I was like, um, I, I could feel that I didn't actually feel that way all the way and that I didn't mm. want to be that pessimistic. And I also had to admit to myself, I don't know enough about this to actually say that to someone. And I wanted to correct all that. And so this became an obsession. And at the same time um, that I was saying that this happened right as the attitudes and norms surrounding LGBTQ issues had shifted very quickly in the United States to the point that the Supreme Court was, it was about to have its decision. And it was also, it was plainly evident to me, look, uh, uh, the, we can change our minds because I looked at the polling on that and about 60 plus percent of Americans had flipped over the course of about five years from opposed to in favor of same-sex marriage. And that was hmm. one of the fastest shifts of public opinion ever recorded. And it happened like if you weren't involved in the activism, it seemed like it happened overnight. If you were involved in the activism, you were aware that it took decades of work to get to that sort of point. But when it did flip, it flipped very quickly. So I wanted to understand those things. I wanted to understand what happens in a person's mind at the level of neurons. Because, uh, to, because I can imagine if you took all the people who had changed their mind about same-sex marriage and you put them in a time machine that went back 10 years, they would argue with themselves. They would, they would see the issue differently to the point, this, and they would argue probably the same way people argue about wedge issues today. So what happened in the interim, in their mind, in their brain? I wanted to understand that, and then I also wanted to be able to go back in time and give advice to that person. I wanted to be able to say to the person, who, when I said, you can't, I, did, I wanted to say, well, here's what you should do. And so yeah. I needed, I had, and that took years <laughs> to figure all that out. But yeah, how that's many years? The, so you were, because this book has a lot of reporting. You're on the ground in a lot of different places. You're talking to a lot of different experts. How, how long did it take you to write this book? Altogether, almost six years. Uh, wow. um, I had the podcast that whole time. So sometimes I'm on the ground out in the world doing that. Sometimes I'm getting, bringing guests on my show to yeah. back up to, to, I have that benefit of being able to ask scientists to come on the show. So uh, back and forth. Yeah. Almost, full, almost a full six years. Uh, the manuscript was in almost ready to go shape a couple of years back, but then um, all sorts of publishing world things happened and COVID happened. And so we pushed back the release date, but yeah. So before we get into how to change people's minds, the two things I want to get through. First of all, let's talk about what that actually means. I want to make sure that everybody understands what we mean by how to change somebody's mind. How do you, how do you describe what that is? I love that you asked this question up front. I wish, I wish <laughs> this is the thing. Like my answer to this question could take six weeks if you wanted to let <laughs> right. me go. Uh, there's 2000 plus years of philosophical discourse on this matter. Uh, and um, there are books that uh, don't even get close uh, that take an entire book to just talk about, you know, what is an attitude? Mm -hmm. um, we, this is a phrase that isn't, uh, it isn't common in every culture and it can mean just about anything. So it's important that we kind of like zero in on what we're talking about. To change your mind, uh, I know that you can take a thousand different mental constructs to talk about this. I try to reduce it down to something easy in the book, which is beliefs, attitudes, and values. Um, it's uh, in the end of the day, it's seeing the world differently than you saw it before. It's interpreting it differently than you saw it before. And it's understanding it in a way you didn't understand before. And that usually happens through an update of some form with of a belief and attitude or a value, a belief being information that's encoded in the brain that carries with it some emo sub emotional sense of confidence about the thing. Uh, like uh, that saying that uh, 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 Patrick Stewart plays Jean-Luc Picard. Like that mm -hmm. is a, that is a, and that's not, that's not just information encoded in your brain. You also are pretty confident that that's true. Um, I could also say, but did, uh, did Sinbad play in a movie uh, in the 1990s in which he was a genie? Uh, this is something that is information encoded in the brain that some people feel is a belief with high confidence and others feel low confidence that that's true. And then we disagree. So there's a, 
those beliefs, whereas attitudes are different. If you ask a person, uh, do you think the president's a good president? And they say, yes, that can feel like they're expressing a belief, but they're expressing an attitude. That's an emotion. That's a, an emotional uh, evaluation of positive or negative regard towards something. And it can be toward anything. It can even be toward another attitude. And then values are where you place something in the hierarchy of your personal hierarchy of what's important. Where should your time and effort go? Um, and all of these things inform each other and mush together in a way that forms our uh, beliefs and our attitudes and our values and our opinions and our notions and everything that we think of as, as to how a mind makes sense of the world. Um, All together, they form what we consider a subjective model of reality of what is and what isn't. And these are the things that change when a person changes their mind. And if your goal is to persuade someone to change their mind in some way, you'll have more success if you, if you upfront kind of express to yourself first, what is the very thing that I'm looking at that I'm trying, that I'm hoping is different. Do I want this person to flip from thinking this is true to false, false to true, positive and negative, negative to positive. Do I want their, that thing that they consider more important than this to be now considered less important than this and so on. If you have a better act, more accurate, clear view of where you're headed, you'll be more likely to get what you want out of it because a technique that aims at a belief isn't very good at aiming at an attitude and vice versa. And so, so that's, that's pretty much where it's at. I'll give you a, a one slightly deeper answer to this, which is at the level of what's going on in the brain, it's, it's assimilation and accommodation. Uh, assimilation and accommodation, this was first put forth by Jean Piaget. It's um, the great psychologist, Jean Piaget, who many people associate with, uh, if you ever got a drink at a bar and they give it to you in a very tall glass and, uh, and you think, wow, they gave me so much. Uh, if you, I hope you remember your Piaget where they, where they trick kids into thinking they get more liquid magically by pouring it from a low short glass into a thin tall glass. Um, <laughs> Ooh, he, 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 he did all that in, uh, in pursuit of this, what he called the, uh, the, uh, the, uh, epistemic genealogy. I think I do I have the, yes. Genetic epistemology. Unbelievably I have the book right here. Behind. <laughs> nice. Um, um, this beautiful, a well-worn. Right yeah look at that by jean piaget um it's a the idea there assimilation is whenever you take uh novel information or ambiguous information and you make it less ambiguous you disambiguate it by fitting it into what you already understand about the world your existing model Hmm. uh and you can an accommodation is when you take information that uh you were previously interpreting through your model, but it's just become so anomalous to the model that you need to update the model instead. So the, the way I describe this in the book is when a child sees a, uh, a, um, when a child sees a dog for the first time, uh, they point at it and you say, look, dog, and something categorical happens in their brain. Something like uh, non-human walks on four legs, furry mm-hmm. dog. Then later on, they see a horse and they point at it and say, dog. Now, that's an attempt at assimilation. That's like, well, look, it's got four legs. It's furry. It's non-human. This fits into my existing understanding. And you say, no, 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 that's a horse. Well, now they must accommodate that the category that used to contain all things like that is, needs to have be sit inside a, a slightly larger category. So horse and dog are now part of something like animal or creature or something like that in the mind of the child. And they literally have to expand their mind to accommodate this larger model of reality that's accommodation and we're doing both of these things at all times that's how we change our minds constantly we're either adding to what we understand via interpretation or updating our interpretation via disambiguation and we do that so much and so often as that eventually the models become very complex and it becomes a lot easier to assimilate than it is to accommodate and we tend to err on the side of assimilation at all times. We get to a point where everything just becomes an example of what we already think, feel, and believe. <laughs> and that's, and that is the nature of most of our baseline resistance. Is it's just so easy to interpret everything as, ah, yeah, yeah, I knew that was going to happen, or, or hey, that's that, like, even when things are surprising, we can make it seem less surprising by saying, well, you know, that does fit into what I understand about the world. So that's that's the roundabout answer to what does it mean to change your mind, right? And I, what I was interested in is, is before we get into what causes people to change their minds, let's get into what doesn't work, because I think we spend a lot of time and a lot of energy <laughs> doing things that are just not going to work. Yeah. Um, 
And one of the things I found really interesting is that you said, you know, facts, just, just throwing a bunch of facts at people doesn't work. Like trying to get people to change their mind by saying, yeah, but no, you know, this, you know, this, this is the, you know, this study in 2014 and you said this and, and the news media is constantly trying to do this. They're always trying to fact check, you know, Trump or whoever, um, and as if that's going to like change this, the minds of, of that party and the people that support Trump. And we know that that just completely doesn't work. And anybody who's ever had the kind of argument with the uncle, you know, at Thanksgiving, uh, the Fox watching uncle at Thanksgiving, and you're throwing up a bunch of facts, they have their facts, right? Mm-hmm. Alternative facts. And it actually makes them more entrenched, um, I feel, in their beliefs than, than less. It actually causes them to be quite defensive. It actually backfires. Mm-hmm. So am I correct in saying like, what are things that people, the mistakes people make in trying to change other people's minds and their own minds? Yeah, the, the, it feels like this would work, right? Like uh, uh, if the issue is harmful and you're aware of the harm, like you can feel like you have the, the moral high ground. If, yeah. Uh, especially if you're engaging with someone who is prejudiced against you in some way. Um, if you know a lot about the issue and you uh, researched it well enough to the point that you are pretty sure that the evidence is on your side, you can be like, well, the, you know, the facts are on my side. And, and it feels like, well, then all I have to do is dump a bunch of information on the other person. They will read that. They'll look at that information and then they will interpret it exactly the way that I did. Mm-hmm. And then they will magically go, oh, thank you for showing me how wrong I was. And then they will now think what you think. Um, <laughs> and I, it sounds very ridiculous when you spell it out, but we sure do feel that's the way it's going to work every time we're arguing with somebody on the internet or with a family yep. member. Or, it's a big um, Twitter technique. Yeah. It's, it's um, the reason it feels like that's going to work is because you are largely unaware of the motivations and drives that led you to cherry pick the evidence to find something that supported and rationalized and justified the way you feel about something. The, it feels, um, it's sort of like that example earlier, I was talking about, uh, when you fall in love with someone you have, uh, you find all the, you find all these reasons why you feel that way. And then when you're falling out, you find all these reasons, uh, the same reasons become reasons why you didn't. It's the motivation is, is, has changed, but the information is sitting there being just as neutral as it was before. Well, that's also true for political issues or for anything, even for like flat earth or conspiratorial things. Like people usually start with some sort of motivation in play and then they go looking for evidence that will support the way they feel about it or that will uh, bolster their group identity or something. And you've done the same thing. And then once all that has been done, you're left with all those arguments inside your mind. And then when someone asks you, why do you feel that way? Why do you believe this? You'll start presenting those justifications that you worked so hard to, to put inside your head as if that's why you feel that way. When really it's not what brought you to those justifications in the first place. Um, the CDC tried this with, uh, but we're talking about bef- prior to uh, COVID, they did this with um, vaccine messaging for these like MMR vaccines and stuff. And they would... They tried all sorts of fact-based approaches where you give people this evidence, even show them pictures of, of, of children who are suffering from like measles. And mm-hmm. what they found was that people tended to uh, update their understanding. Like if they were factually incorrect, they would say, well, thank you for showing me how factually incorrect I was about that. Well, tell me how much you, uh, how do you feel about vaccinating? Like I'm now even less likely to mm-hmm. vaccinate my child than before you showed me all this stuff. And the reason is because they're counter arguing in their mind every time you present this information and or they're interpreting the information as evidence that they were right all along in some way. Interesting. And and what you're doing is bolstering the worldview and the attitude that brought them to that worldview has never been addressed in the messaging. That's why it doesn't seem to work. The same thing happens in a political argument. Uh, I'm dumping all sorts of facts, hoping to copy and paste the way I feel into you. But my reasoning process that led there can never be copied and pasted into you. Your reasoning process has to arrive at something else. And so the conversation has to, if it's ever this win-lose debate framing, never going to work. Never. Uh, it, it'll work. There, there are two types of, of uh, conversation that I talk about in the book, uh, topic rebuttal and technique rebuttal. I don't mean that facts never work. Facts work in good faith environments where everybody's playing by the same rules and is aware of like, you know, the power of, of evidence. And uh, there's some sort of um, like you get some sort of uh, 
status or reputational reward for being a good member of the community by uh, carefully evaluating how you think and feel and updating and saying you're wrong. So the scientific organizations, uh, uh, academic organizations, some legal sometimes, uh, debate frames where people go behind lecterns and stand in front of an audience. Like if everybody's playing by the same rules and it's a good faith environment, facts can be very valuable. And that's why we have wonderful things like uh, the uh, James Webb telescope, because we that's a space where people are playing that game. Mm -hmm. But that's something we had to create. We had to invent that. Uh, in normal everyday conversation or any kind of regular debate situation, uh, argumentation frame, deliberation, we tend to uh, have more success with something called technique rebuttal. And technique rebuttal is saying, uh, I don't care what you think. And I'm not, I'm not focused on what you, th what you think. I'm focused on how you are thinking. I'm not focused on what you believe, but why you believe that. I'm not mm -hmm. focused on um, the strength of your attitude so much as what is generating the strength of your attitude. And what I want to do is engage with you in a way that helps you discover that for yourself so that you'd never feel like I'm forcing anything on you. I'm not manipulating you. I'm not coercing you. I'm not trying to copy paste anything. I'm not saying you ought to feel a certain way. And I'm not shaming you for how you currently feel. Instead of being this face-to-face -face thing, uh, I'm asking us to go into a shoulder-to-shoulder -shoulder situation. And the situa instead of saying, uh, uh, I, uh, you're right and I'm wrong, uh, uh, I'm right and you're wrong. I'm, I'm, I'm saying, hmm, I think you're a smart, intelligent, reasonable human being. And I know you have a lot of reasons for what you think, feel, and believe. I wonder how come then I see this so differently than you. I find that very mysterious. And I wonder if you would like to partner up with me on a collaboration to explore the mystery of why we might disagree on this. I wonder why we disagree. That's a completely different frame. And it gets it out of this, the binary of right, wrong. It also gets out of the win, lose, because now we're actually working together to understand the nature of our disagreement. And that is from all of this work for so many years, that's where you're going to find more success than you will the other frame. The other frame is going to generate what they call reactants, which is just that feeling that the thing when you're telling a teenager or you, if you don't have teenagers, if you've ever been a teenager, Mm -hmm. I have teenagers. So <laughs> let me, let me, I can you tell them, me. you tell them something that you absolutely know will benefit them because you love them. Mm -hmm. And you have, you absolutely do have wisdom in this regard. And they even know that they even feel this person loves me. This person cares about me. They have wisdom in this regard. They know more about the world than I do yet. The way they just said that to me makes me feel like, don't tell me what to do. I will rebel. And I'll just, and I will actually do a bad thing or think a stupid thing because I am don't want to be told what to think and feel or do. We all have those. It's reactants. It's one of the it's the basic tenet of all therapy is never generate reactants in the client. And it's very easy to do. It's very easy to feel. So that that framing that we get into or like, sorry, you're just wrong about that. Like we what the other person feels is, oh, I you think I'm stupid or you think yeah. I'm untrustworthy or you think that the group I'm associated with is a bad group to be associated with. How about no? How about this conversation's over? Or they or they'll push you and then you'll push back harder. And then you get into the pushback framing of, of goes into a loop, a negative feedback loop where you just eventually have those. I hate the phrase, let's agree to disagree. Like, like, uh, like, like we already agreed to disagree. That's how this started. Like, the, <laughs> like, like that is, that's what, you're, most <laughs> what you're saying is let's not talk anymore because I don't like talking to you, which is totally okay to say, but that's also the end of the conversation that you could have had. Yeah. That's almost as bad as, okay, you do you. <laughs> I mean, you really say like, well, you're an entity that exists in this world and I have no desire to interact with you anymore. Thank you. Bye-bye. Yeah. Thank you. Bye -bye. <laughs> we are closed. <clears throat> All right. So let's, let's now seg into, into thing. And you've already kind of talked to about some of the persuasive techniques. It seems like questioning is a big part of it. Asking questions, thoughtful questions. Um, and, and there's a whole science to this, obviously, and I'm very much simplifying it. You talk about an organization called, I think, Deep Canvassing or maybe- uh, Yeah, the, the, the technique is Deep Canvassing. The, the organization is the, uh, the Leadership Lab. The Leadership Lab, which is in my backyard here, right? Yeah. They're in LA. Mm -hmm. um, and I've got to go and hang out with these guys because- They I, would love that. They would love I, that. I would love to learn more about their techniques. And so this is, explain what the, what, um, the lab does, what this organization does and what Deep Canvassing is, because this is one technique of persuasion that you- Sure. Um, and to preface this, I spent time in the book. I spent time with people who are in cults and pseudo cults and spiritual communities and so mm -hmm. on. 
And then I spent time with people who left those groups. Uh, and that's one sort of angle of the investigation is to try to understand the science behind all that. Another angle of the investigation was I want to spend time with people who they actively change people's minds. They, they yeah. legitimately are in the, in the business of can I change people's minds? And I was astonished to meet all these different groups. Deep canvassing is one. Then there's street epistemology and smart politics and so on. And most of them had done this A-B testing thing where they would have hundreds with, with deep canvassing. They had, at this point, they've had almost 20,000 conversations recorded on video. They throw away what doesn't work, keep what does, iterate, mm -hmm. and then land on something that works consistently. And all those organizations doing that, I was, this is the, probably the most thrilling part of the whole book process for me was, wait, they, they all had the same technique pretty much. And it was uh, yeah. in pretty much the same order if they had steps. And I started to think of it like, well, you know, if you were to, if you were to build, when you were built, whoever built the first airplane, no matter where they built it on earth, it was going to look like an airplane because they're all having to deal with physics and, <laughs> and they're all on the same planet. And so it all suggested like, there's something very fundamental about how uh, the brain works when it gets into a situation of, um, okay, you have a perspective, I have a perspective, let's sort this out sort of thing. And the things that actually get, will are more likely to lead to success follow a very similar uh, structure. So with deep canvassing, many of them are very similar to something called motivational interviewing. I can get that in a second, but with deep canvassing, uh, this is an organization in your neck of the woods in Los Angeles, though now it's global. Um, they started tr by trying to understand how um, the outcome of Prop 8 could have been so uh, uh, opposite what they expected. You know, this uh, uh, California voted against same-sex marriage, and it was just astounding for that yeah. to happen in a, such a liberal uh, place in the country, such a uh, LGBTQ-friendly place. And so to try to figure out why that was, the Los Angeles LGBT Center has a political action wing called the LAB, or the, the Leadership Lab, Learn, Act, Build. And they were like, well, let's just go out and ask, which was a very, it was, it was the work of uh, the great Dave Fleischer. And he said, why don't we just go door to door and just ask people who voted against us, why did you do that? It was, it was at the time, it was considered bonkers to, to just yeah. go ask. Kind of scary, especially of that <laughs> issue, which is, can be very uh, yeah. anxious. Yeah. So they did. They went door to door and they asked. And to their great astonishment, people really wanted to tell them. Hmm. And, and, um, they would listen and sometimes they would argue and sometimes they would try to dump facts on people. And they noted, first of all, they discovered why people voted against them, which we had pretty much had to, it was this one attack ad where it was a little girl who ran out and said, mommy, mommy, I learned in class today that a prince can marry a prince and a princess can marry a princess. And the mom's like, whoa. And then, and then, <laughs> and then this dude comes in from the side. It looks like he's going to sell your furniture. And he says, don't think it could happen. It's already happened. And it's one right. of those kind of ads. Yeah. Uh, a lot of people who thought that they were uh, allies, who thought that they were very uh, progressive, that ad made them go, mm, I don't know, though. I don't want them telling my kids what to think. You know, they made them, they, they attacked them at the, the weak point, which was feeling like they, the liberty over their child's upbringing was where they were, where they were getting them. Mm -hmm. So what they noticed uh, in those conversations, though, after doing thousands, after having hundreds of those, was that three times the person they were talking to in the middle of the conversation changed their mind hmm. just in the course of talking about it. And they were like, what happened there? And they reviewed those tapes over and over again because they started, they started recording it on video, the conversations they were having just so they could review them, was that the canvasser had not really said anything. They just kept asking questions and the person kept uh, explaining themselves to themselves. And as they did so, they started thinking, well, you know, when you think about it, and I'm sure we've all experienced this before, if you've ever asked, like, like, uh, hey, do you like the, what do you think about the, the, uh, the second season of Westworld? I'm like, I love it. I mean, it's like, well, you know, when you, well, I mean, it's the way I love it. I mean, it's like, it's got, to, the person just starts explaining it to the, and then by the end of it, like, you know, when you think about it, I hate it. Like, <laughs> like, that's a worst show I've ever watched in my life. Yeah. Like they open with, I love it. And at the end of it, they yeah. say, I hate it because they talk yeah. themselves out of it. That was what yeah. they were seeing. Maybe you haven't and thought about it so deeply. You know, we don't always think about everything so deeply. Right. right. And yeah. I thought, is there a way to facilitate that kind of introspection? And so they A-B tested it over and over again. And what they arrived at was a, ser were a series of steps. And the way deep canvassing works, they all pretty much start this way. If you, you open with rapport because you want to avoid the reactants, as we, as we mentioned earlier, assure the other person you're not there to shame them 
or ostracize them, ask for their consent, and then say, you know, I'm just really here to figure out, or to, I'm really here to understand how you feel about this. I want to know how you feel about it. I will be a compassionate, non-judgmental listener to your views. And then almost, there's almost no one I can imagine who wouldn't say, yes, I would love to tell you how I feel about this issue. Mm -hmm. Then you ask them on a scale, this is the most important thing, and this is in all the techniques. Um, they, they use a scale from one to 10. Some people use zero to 10, some use one to 100, but you ask for where do you feel on the scale? And since these issues are attitude-based, you're asking, where would you put yourself on a scale from this should be illegal to this should be legal? Like that sort of, mm -hmm. that sort of framing. If it's gun control, you could do it like that. Like, do you think that all guns should be banned or do you think uh, that we should all get a gun in the mail every month? You know, like, where are you on the scale? <laughs> and if a person says seven, you ask, um, why does that number feel right to you? And this is an incredible reframing of, this gets you out of debate. Mm -hmm. This gets you out of binary. This gets you out of win-lose. This gets you into, I'm here to help you explore your thoughts on this matter. Where are you at on this issue? Like seven? Okay, why, is, why seven? Why not eight? Why not six? And have that kind of unfurling conversation. You could do that right now. Like, if, like, we're, like uh, you know, if you saw Top Gun Maverick, like what would you give Top Gun Maverick? Uh, right. Seven, maybe seven, eight, seven. I thought it was eight. kind of an eight, to be honest with you. Eight. Well, yeah, like, I just saw like, it last week, yeah. Yeah, but why not a 10? One out of 10? No, why not 10? Oh, why not a 10? Um, hmm, that's a good question. I think because uh, it, oh God, why did why not a 10? You know what? I, you've already won. I got it. It's a 10. No because, 10 <laughs> like, no, because to me, 10 is like the great movies, like The Godfather and, you know, the great movies of all time. And it wasn't, it didn't rise up to that level. It was just a very entertaining a satisfying movie going experience yeah yeah so i hope you could felt it just then too right like like you're like wait a second have i not it. already done this like have okay. i not already done this for myself i was so quick to the to the eight yeah but then when i ask well what's your justification for that is what are your reasons for that it's so you can feel yourself going oh let me let me do something magical yeah which is come up with thoughts that i've never had before elaborate something and then generate arguments in my mind that weren't there if i was trying to push you up to 10 i wouldn't ask you why not a 10 i'd ask you the other direction i'd say why not okay you're at eight how come not a five right and you might start you're going to start producing arguments for why you're so high yeah which are which are counter arguments against being low um that's motivational interviewing it's a very common practice in therapy when somebody wishes to change their behavior like alcoholism or drug addiction uh, if they're trying to get out of that um you can ask them questions in a such a way where they generate their own counter arguments for the thing. And you're not the one generating the counter arguments. Cause remember we will resist when other people tell us how to think, but we won't resist when we tell ourselves how to think. So they, uh, they open with that. Like what's the number one? Does that feel right to you? That person enters into a very introspective metacognitive state. And then they often will share a story about someone who's affected by the issue. If it's a political issue, sometimes they even play a video of someone affected by it. And then they'll ask the person if there's an attack ad that's running, they'll run the attack ad. And then they'll say, now, how do you feel? And if the number moves, they'll say, why did the number move? And then now you're doing that kind of introspection for, hmm, what just got activated inside of me by this attack ad? And it's giving you some, uh, some power over that, some agency over it. And then um, once the person gives you all the reasons, make sure you're always repeating them back in their own words, ask if you've done a good job. Um, if if the issue is related to something like uh, some sort of oppression, some sort of prejudice, ask them about a time in their life where they've experienced something similar. Ask them if there was a time in life where they didn't have, they, they didn't feel that way. Where did they first learn about the issue? If you keep asking questions like that, the person will keep exploring it in a way they've never done before. Um, they'll produce counter arguments they've never considered before. And they may start, may start to experience some cognitive dissonance. They might start thinking, hmm, I have life experiences that don't match the way I have just stated my opinion. I don't have a lot of knowledge about this issue. So this is very received wisdom and all that's happening on their side. Like you're not calling them out. They're not losing face. And at no point are you trying to copy paste anything into them. It's all happening inside themselves. They're, they're in control the entire way. And they will feel that um, the expansion that, that they'll feel that complexification of the concept in a way that they've never had before. And they may actually form their first true opinion right there in front of you. And, allowing a person space because what you're really doing is giving them space to think 
you're holding space to think, and you're being a non-judgmental listener in a way that gives them a chance to complexify their, their, their worldview on this topic. I have watched hundreds of these videos. It is, it doesn't seem like this is possible, but people routinely talk themselves into a new position. And it's almost always in, in the direction of less prejudice. If, it, if it's an issue that involves that kind of thing. Um, if it's an issue of absolute certainty, like something like uh, the earth is flat, like you, you know, a person will leave a state of absolute certainty and go to a state of, hmm, I, well, I could be wrong about that. It's, an, it's incredible to see. And yeah. uh, uh, that's deep canvassing in a nutshell. And it's so effective right now that it's being used in political campaigns. In the, in the midterms coming up, there will be phone banks around the country where hundreds of people will be uh, using deep canvassing uh, to call voters and affect their attitudes on a variety of issues. But this this technique, and this is similar to the technique that you described late in the book, the, the street epistemology, this technique takes some time and it takes mm -hmm. it takes training like right you you need to be you have to have done this a few times you have to master this sort of technique and I'm making it sound like it's some sort of trick. You know, but I mean, it really is just a lot of listening. Well, that's a comment. Right I'll, I'll only interrupt you for a second to say people do ask that a lot because I think that there's a fear that this is brainwashing or manipulation yeah. and that it can be used for evil intent. Uh, number one, there's no such thing as brainwashing that's pseudoscientific and isn't real. And uh, two, the since this involves no copy pasting, the there's very little chance to use this in a coercive, manipulative way. Like you're you're helping a person. You're, you're more than anything, you're helping them leave a state of undeserved certainty on the issue. But yeah, go ahead, go ahead. But but, but what's interesting is about that, and, and again, I've had some experience with a cult. I grew up, my parent, my family was in a cult when I was growing up, and so I, oh, wow. I have experience with a charismatic guru and um, you know being persuaded in that way. And the difference there is that guru is telling you what to think, and in this technique, you are you are being encouraged to think for yourself. Um, uh, you know, it's not you think this way. It's how, what do you think? And you're, you're, you know, it's, it's actually a lot of questioning your own motivations and stuff. So it, it, it is different, um, uh, in my experience. And, and so, um, so, so this technique, so again, my back to the point, like, it seems like a very effective, and I'm glad to hear that political campaigns are using it. And yet it does take time. And it's not something that you can, like somebody can just do in a political speech, uh, and, and then change everybody's mind. Right. So it really is like this deep, this idea of canvassing, it really is like a door to door, individual yeah. person to person techniques. It's very time consuming and it's so time consuming. No, there's no way to do it in a mass way, right? You yeah. can't. When I, when I went, I, the, I went out and did it three times. Each time it was a group of 75 to 100 people in pairs, one person recording, one person talking. And like, it was incredible how difficult it was. I mean, I remember Steve telling me the person I was canvassing with, Steve DeLine, he was like, uh, cause I almost died. I was like, I was like laying in the, in the shadow of a car sweating and dying. And he was like, yeah. yeah, this is why we, this is why campaigns don't do this. It's a lot harder than shoving some flyers in somebody's face. Like this is tough. Yeah. And it has to be, does it have to be face to face? One-on-one. -on -one? It, it works much better face to face. Uh, there's lots of scientists researching different ways of, of this kind of interaction uh, online, um, text-based and that sort of thing. Uh, Zoom type, you know, they, they COVID did give us this, which is, the ability yeah. to talk to each other in this way, uh, literal, actual flesh uh, and blood face to face, much more powerful. We just are, we just evolved to be able to think in that way, to, 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 um, to receive information better that way. Like there are thousands of micro expressions on our faces and uh, tone in our voice and body uh, language that we keep up with that really helps in this regard. Um, next best thing is video. And, uh, and then when it comes to talking to somebody online or by text message, you have to be really particular because it's so easy to, to misinterpret and it's so easy to um, uh, not know that to not, you have to do so much work to make sure the other person isn't misinterpreting what you're about to say. Have you ever seen somebody on Twitter, like address a topic that's controversial and they have to spend the first 12 tweets saying, what I'm not saying is this, what I'm yeah. not saying is this, what I'm not saying. Right. It's easy. It's so much easier to do that in person. It's yeah. much easier to get that across very quickly. I was going to, uh, you know, because yeah. I was going to say like there, it seems like this technique would not work as well on social media or work at all, which is a lot of times when you face these kind of trolls whose minds you want to change. Um, but it's not going it, to getting into a long, I mean, maybe if somebody has the time, maybe there is a, a an endless. Well, there's good news in that regard because uh, Tom Stafford, the cognitive uh, 
uh, psychologist at a chef field is exploring that right now. Uh, I did an episode about that a couple of episodes back. Um, the, there's a sort of the peanut butter and chocolate of my comeuppance in this book <laughs> is that uh, one, I talk about how reasoning, um, human reasoning isn't flawed or irrational. It's just biased and lazy, which is something I, I talk about in detail. We have two systems for, for uh, the great Hugo Mercy and Dan Sperber uh, explain this to me. They uh, also cognitive psychologists um, we have one system for, for producing arguments and one for evaluating arguments. And the one that produces arguments produces them very quickly, which means to say they do also does it lazily. And, uh, and it's also biased because, you know, it's coming out of my mind. It's going to be biased. Uh, if you, I like to think of it as uh, if we're like some cave people trying to decide if we're going to go into a certain area of the woods uh, and there's a person in our group who was attacked by a bear in that area of the woods, they're going to produce an argument that says, I don't think you should go there. It's a bad place to go. And I want that person to do that. I want that very biased person to tell me about the bear that tried to attack them. At the same time, uh, there may be another person who has been hunting for 50 years and they've been in that area for their whole life. And they're like, look, look, it's very unlikely we're going to get attacked by a bear. I think you just, you know, it's totally cool. Like I've been there many times, come with me. I want all these people to produce their biased arguments. You've also all experienced, everyone's experienced this when they're trying to decide to go, where you're going to go get, um, lunch or dinner with a group of friends or just with one other person yeah like hey where do you want to go eat if that have you ever had that discussion where you're like oh god i've got you, like, you mean, like i'm mr non-decisive and i always want people to make that decision for me hey where do you want to go eat the other person's like i don't know where do you want to go eat you're like damn how did this already start like the, right. <laughs> the, the classic well, you, and uh but if you're like a group of five people, you're like, let's go get sushi somewhere and somebody's like i don't want to go get sushi last time i got sushi i got sick well that's their very lazy bias reason for not getting it somebody else might say i have an ex that works at this place somebody else might say i just had sushi last week everybody produces their their easy crappy arguments first and then as a group we start sorting it out it's the evaluation process where we put all of our labor so that directly relates to the uh the that's the peanut butter of my come up and the chocolate is uh something called the truth win scenario and the truth win scenario is um uh, I, I, I love the truth ones there. It's um, there's a, uh, here's an example for the people listening. Um, if it takes a machine, uh, if it takes five machines, five minutes to make five widgets, how long would it take a hundred machines to make a hundred widgets? That's a question from the cognitive reflection task. When you ask people in isolation, uh, most people, there's like several questions. Most people get at least one of them wrong. And then there's a, a, most people get make, make a mistake on that one. If you don't give them, but about 10 seconds to give you an answer. Or they'll, or they'll say, I don't know. Um, I do this thing now to demonstrate this in lectures. I'll give, uh, I'll put that question out to the group and I ask everybody to give an an get an answer privately. Don't share it. And I say, is there anybody in the group who really, really feels like they have the answer to this question? I mean, you, you know, you got the answer. Yeah. That person raises their hand that I give them a microphone and say, um, what's the answer? And they say five minutes. And I say, could you please explain your reasoning? If it takes five minutes, five machines, five minutes to make five widgets, it takes one machine, five minutes to make one widget. Each machine's making widget every five minutes. If we have a hundred machines working together, each one can make a widget in five minutes, 100 widgets, five minutes. They'll say it in their own words, but what you'll, what you'll hear is when the person says the answer, five minutes, the group goes, eh, you can feel mm -hmm. the, that everybody's private answers are kind of off. And then when they give their reasoning, they'll go, ah, and I'll, and what you, that's called the truth win scenario. I, I borrowed that from Tom Stafford's work in isolation. People, uh, will come up with a very lazy sort of intuitive response to that answer. But then when, even in that, even that situation, there's a few people who get the right answer, but if we're, t if we're measuring everybody alone, it seems like everybody, there's a majority of people get the answer wrong. But if we put people in groups, that one person who sees it differently and sees the right way can share that and we will all click over immediately to the right answer. So you go from majority incorrect to majority correct just by giving people a chance to deliberate. That, that is a, something that we could apply to the internet. That's a way of taking a lot of what we've spoke, spoken about today and putting it in situations where we don't necessarily have to be face to face. And right now, Tom Stafford is taking lots of stuff like this and creating uh, new platforms or taking way, creating things you could do to, to tweak things like Twitter and Facebook and, and all the other social media spots so that they could be more amenable to this type of conversation, which they are not right now. We'll give you that. They're, 
they are set up for a, for the argument production thing, mm-hmm. not the argument evaluation thing. It's very well, easy for all the re- resolution thing. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, yeah. We don't tend to close our loops very well. No, we just media. get to, like you said, the confirmation bias is just uh, we just get uh, little dopes of dopamine for you know getting a gre- yeah. gr- green. Yeah, social media is great for grouping up, but it's really bad for like my friend Alistair Kroll said. Here's the internet in a nutshell. I know we're about to get we're over time, but, but I'll say that uh, he said when you say uh, I would like a grilled uh, cheese sandwich on the internet you're not saying uh you're not making an argument for grilled cheese sandwiches what you're saying is who wants to join me in the grilled cheese room uh so it's a lot different than like if you're with a group of friends saying hey you want to get a grilled cheese sandwich because in that situation you're making an argument you're like this is what i want what do you think online you're just saying like who else wants exactly what i want let's go leave everybody else behind and go to the room where we are are the only people who want that thing and we'll all get it that's what the internet does. And once we're in our little groups like that, it's really tough to not get polarized. It's really tough to not get into us versus them thinking. And that it's really tough to have the kind of conversations that lead to the truth in that way. All right. So we have like five minutes here, right? Cause I think you have to go like 10, 15. Yeah. Yeah. I got what I got to interview at the hour. Yeah. Okay, cool. Um, I was interested in the beginning of the interview. You said that when you were reading the section about the Westboro church um, that you got a little bit emotional and I'm curious Tell us a little bit, you know, in brief about that your experience of going to that and people might need to know a little bit more if they don't know what the Westboro Church is and then why that, what you learned and what, why that kind of made you a bit emotional. Sure. Um, and, you know, like, I, I wish we had more time. I'd love to hear more about your experiences growing up around cult. I'll come uh, on your podcast. Let's do it. Let's do it. Let's do it. Let's man. do it. Be uh, home for home, as they say. I love that. Yeah. Um, <clears throat> I grew up with a lot of, I grew up with a couple of LGBT Q friends, uh, my uncle, and I had a really close friend named Mikey. I want to get, I already feel it coming up, man. I already feel my eyes going, oh, going glassy. I had a really close friend. His, his name was Mikey. Um, he, uh, he died of pancreatic cancer at the age of 39 mm-hmm. and he died right before the Supreme court decision. And he was just lived in a, in Mississippi and just lived in the closet, right? The Southern mm-hmm. closet. And he had been beaten up a couple of times and it, spending time at Westboro uh, at the time I went there, they were about to protest Hallmark the next day. I went there uh, on Valentine's day to their Valentine's day services. And the next day they were going into Kansas city to protest Hallmark for creating the first uh, same sex um, Valentine's day cards. Mm-hmm. And it was, it was deeply emotional to hang out with them in a way where I needed, I wanted to maintain objectivity just in the sense that I didn't want to ruin the interviews, but I mean, I certainly wasn't being objective. I certainly felt, I felt what was, I felt a a righteous, like I'm, uh, I want to, is it, can I curse in the show? Yeah. Yeah. Uh, I, I I was, I was, I was fucking horrified and, and and angry at them in a way, but they also were expecting that. And that was what gives them their power. That's what they like that energy. Yeah. They're, they've, they've, they're, they, they've trolled their way into fame and they know that um that was deeply emotional but also like i went to the baptist they're a baptist church right i grew up in a baptist church Mm. and when i was sitting there in the pews the thing that washed over me was i expected this to be like like some sort of something out of a movie like at the end of a, a staking dirt road with with like creepy ghostly trees everywhere it was just a Baptist church. I've been in this a thousand times. And the thing that was most unsettling was that it was familiar to me. Yeah. And I think I, when I wrote it, that really hit hard. And then I put it away. I was like, somebody can, can read this, but I don't have to return it to it. But when I, I was reading it out loud as the audiobook, I was right there back in that feeling again. And um, it was also tremendous to spend time with Megan Phelps Roper and um, um, Zach. Uh, These are people who left the church. Who's who. And they're, you know, their stories of what, of what they went through and why they left and what they got out of it. They can't just casually tell you their stories. Like it is a, tr- it is a, I remember, I was remembering their interviews and uh, the bravery that they have to, to exhibit to sit down for what might be the thousandth time and tell somebody about this uh, isn't, is incredible. I, I, you can see, them stealing themselves with, for strength to go through what they've gone through and and still and still they cry because mm. they lost their mom they lost their their family 
that they didn't just leave a church they left their family because they're 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 fa it's a family you know it's it had a patriarch and they're all kids and grandkids it's deeply emotional and um i know we don't have time to go all the way into it but the in the book i try to talk about what does it take for a person to leave all of that and can you replicate it you know could you encourage it and it has a lot more to do with uh it's it's the it's the hardest thing to get somebody out of is something that's, that's reached the level of uh community in that way whether it's a conspiratorial mm -hmm. community or a cult yeah and, the, and the, but the off-ramping process is pretty much the same and every person who leaves it's almost always someone from another community offers them an opportunity to affirm their values in a different group right and they but they offer that i mean you talk about how to be something hard imagine offering a fig you know off, not a fig leaf offering a, uh an olive branch or a fig leaf in this regard um imagine i uh, just imagine extending your hand to someone in Westboro Baptist Church and saying, it's okay. I want, I, I, I am not going to judge you. I want to hear you out. I want to talk to you about this and see where you're coming from. Can you, it's tough, but that's how they left. Those I mean, people. I wish, yeah, I wish in the times when I was in the cult that I was in, I wish that I had somebody that came to me and said, look, there's a way out of this. Um, you know, I mean, listen, I didn't have a Westboro type of situation, but I can understand that the pull of family and community and that the, the shame and guilt and fear of leaving um a group an organized group like that um and it, it would help so much to have had somebody that could say there's a better way and not just say like you're crazy for being in this thing or you know come have a drink with me and you know it, it, so I, that's interesting so they that was how they were able to get out they they found an exit ramp through another organization with uh with megan it was um she left because uh, a jewish man even Westboro is extremely anti-Semitic. Uh, a Jewish man was kind to her and and he listened to her and talked to her and established a relationship, not a not a like a, a romantic relationship, a friendship to yeah. where in, and was on her side, prevented people from hurting. I remember her. hearing that story. She, I think she might have written a book, or I remember hearing. Oh yeah, she has a great book. Yeah, she has a great book called on, uh, and then um, Zach was a little different. He uh, he had started going to school. And he was learning all about medical things. He was going to be a nurse. And uh, it was very clear that his, his desire to help people was, was stronger than his desire to hurt people. And, and uh, when he hurt his own back, the church was like, uh, wouldn't believe what he did was telling them. They were telling me you know, something about his faith. And that was sort of the crack that started the avalanche. You know, sort of the mix of my metaphors, but that was the crack that led in the light. With uh, Charlie Veach, who I talked about in the, early in the book, who's a 9-11 truther. Yeah, he had started, but he would become part of another community called Truth Juice, which is more about uh, ayahuasca and third eye and stuff like that, where he was. So his values that got him, the things that led him into the conspiratorial community could be better uh, appreciated and affirmed in this other group. And once he had a foot in two worlds, he had the permission or he, the, inside of himself, he knew that he could go against the grain without facing total ostracism and shame because he, the other group wouldn't shame him for that. Right. So. And the offboarding of those communities is, tends to be very similar. It, 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 it's it's the it's, Brooke Harrington told me that the Eagles MC square of social science is the fear of social death is greater than the fear of physical death. If the ship is going down, we'll put our wow. reputations in the lifeboat and we will gladly let our body go to the bottom of the ocean. And that's the most that's the strongest motivation. And if that's the pri if that's the only if that's the primary motivation for a person holding on to something, like which is what's happening in a cult or conspiratorial community. That's the hardest thing to pull somebody out of because you're trying to pull somebody out of, you know, a couple hundred million years of evolution saying, don't ever be alone in this world. So you have to offer them the free, the, 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 uh, you have to also offer them the, the affirmation and the, um, the promise that you won't be alone if you were to leave this organization. Yeah, nobody and that, wants to be alone. yeah. And the fear yeah. of social death, that is so fascinating. You know, I think of like, what can we do? And I know we need to go, but you know, to get to get the MAGA people to to see things a little <laughs> different or the, the QAnon, you know, like, again, you don't want to jump from one cult to another, but, you know, maybe using the values that those people have, which I'm, I'm assuming might be rooted in something positive um, to maybe follow a person or a belief that yeah. more constructive. No, that's what you have to do. You have to connect on the, you have to discover their values, connect on their values and their anxieties, and then create messaging that, that is, uh, that, takes all that into account and puts it front and center. What you don't do is say you're a bunch of deplorables. Yeah. Uh, what you, the worst what you thing she could have said. Yeah. What you, what you don't do is say, 
uh, the things that you value in this world are dumb and you shouldn't think that way. So, but like when it comes to environmental stuff and I'll, I'll leave you on this, like there's as a, I cut this out of the book because it was just too much stuff at a certain point. I cut out, cut out about 45,000 words, but hmm. there's a the very specific messaging. If you want to create, if you want to talk about environmental issues with somebody who's really, really mega headed out on you, you just say something that you don't say we're all in this together. You don't say, uh, don't you want to make the world a better place? What you say is, um, America would be really what we're trying to do. Uh, America will be so weak if we allow the climate change to get out of control. Uh, America will not be able to defend itself against its uh, its uh, the enemies who want to destroy us. Don't you want a country that's strong? Don't you want a country that where the flag can wave over a park where your kids can play? And that that sort of thing. Yeah. Uh, or you frame it as an enemy, say uh, like COVID. Like if COVID had been framed as COVID is this terrible enemy that's trying to destroy the, the country and we want to, to take up arms against it. That's that's plugging into the values of that organization instead of speaking from your values. David McCraney, this is so interesting. I wish I had two hours with you. To be continued. I do too, man. I I, uh, hey, reach out to me anytime. This has been fantastic. And yeah. yeah, come on the show. I would love it. Well, hey, everyone. Thanks for watching the Right About Now podcast on YouTube. Subscribe below for more videos just like this one. And hey, if you like what you saw, go to writeaboutnowmedia.com and subscribe to my podcast. Got new episodes every week just for you. Peace.